Well, I have a couple minutes after one o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for making time uh, for today's session. Uh, for those of you that uh, I have not met previously, my name is Jack DeRocky, and I'm Dean of the Graduate School at Winthrop University. Uh, it is my pleasure to serve as president of the Conference of Southern Graduate Schools. Uh, and uh, that is the body that is putting on today's forum. Uh, with the uh, current uh, health uh, uh, crisis, the current pandemic, CSGS uh, has sought to find new ways to serve members. And like all crises, some positives can come out of it. Um, and we're real excited to be offering these monthly fora uh, to our membership. And what's equally exciting is we're expanding into forum discussions that serve far more than just deans, right? Because <laughs> there's a lot more involved in graduate education than just deans sitting around uh, talking about the, the broader, uh, higher level stuff. And so we're real excited to have these concepts and issues and topics that come through that are really on the ground, right? Uh, that, that really are a part of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. A couple days ago, CSGS hosted a uh, forum on recruitment and recruiters and folks involved in recruitment at many of our member institutions participated in that and it was a great success. Uh, that forum as well as today's forum um, uh, was recorded uh, and George Flowers, our, the treasurer of CSGS has worked to get that uh, recording posted on our webpage um, uh, after a little bit of drama earlier today, but the drama has been solved. So we're very excited about that. So, um, and then the last thing I would like to mention is uh, our next forum uh, has um, uh, been moved to Wednesday, November 13th. Um, I think I have that date correct at one o'clock and it will be on, uh, Kim, it's been moved a week later. Um, uh, uh, given that the election is the Tuesday night, uh, <laughs> Uh, we were thinking that perhaps it would be good to move it back a week, um, either depending upon what happens with the election, regardless of your chosen candidate, that Wednesday may have its own sort of drama. And so we'd like to push back uh, that week. Regardless, more information will come on that and the topic of that forum, uh, which Peter Harries, Dean of the Graduate School at NC State University and Ruth Barr uh, at South Southern Florida University, they will be uh, helping facilitate a forum on research in the age of COVID. How do we get graduate research restarted and supported in this current environment and looking forward? Uh, but with that, let's pivot to today's conversation. Uh, the three minute thesis is a wonderful part of what so many of our member institutions do. It's a part of the annual CSGS conference uh, and it will be again come February. We are planning to have a virtual conference in February. More details on that will come. Uh, but most schools are now pivoting to managing and hosting a virtual 3MT uh, competition. And many schools have those already scheduled for the fall. And uh, membership suggested, and it's a great suggestion, that we hear from some authorities on how best to facilitate those. Uh, I can see Mary grinning right now uh, with the questionable use of authority as a concept, but nonetheless, there it is. So it is my pleasure to introduce Mary Farmer Kaiser, who is Dean of the Graduate School at the University of Louisiana Lafayette. Uh, and uh, she is also joined by Philip DeMahe, also at Lafayette. Uh, and both of them are about to uh, shut down because of a hurricane. So we really appreciate their higher priority being serving our organization. Um, and uh, thank you for <laughs> making time, both of you. I'm going to shut up now and turn it over to the two of you. Mary, uh, you can go ahead and take over. And again, thanks so much. Well, thank you for um, allowing us to jump in and to lead this uh, forum today. I, I do question the use of the word um, authority here. Um, for me, I do not question it with um, uh, in relationship to Philip, however, because he know? has been running our um, 3MT competitions for the past several years. But the 3MT is, without any hesitation, a highlight at our university, and it is um, a huge highlight at the, the annual meeting. And we were committed to keeping that as um, a central part of what we're going to be doing in February, late February. And so what we wanted to do today is to talk about the 
how it's going to work um, and also within that context of course how we are all kind of adjusting our competitions on our own campuses and um, hopefully provide you some guidance so you can maybe align uh, with what we're going to do. So with that, I want to say first, thank you for everybody um, joining us. And I'm really happy to see so many um, assistant deans and programming coordinators and, and so forth on the call here today. We want to hear from you. We want to hear um, the challenges and more importantly, how you've solved those challenges um, today. So we went ahead and put together um, a PowerPoint because I saw Sharon session on Tuesday and she seemed to raise the bar like she does. Um, so it's just a basic PowerPoint and we will um, share it um, with everybody as well. So Okay, can you see? Did I do that right? Thank you, Kim. <laughs> All right, so we're going to talk about hosting and what we have promised, like I said, was to introduce the virtual competition uh, rules and the competitor Thank you. instructions. And um, of course, this will be um, all at our virtual meeting in February. But mostly we want to learn from one another here. So we, we definitely want to encourage um, conversation here today. So the basics, uh, we're going to be hosting the 3MT competition as a synchronous event, virtually via Zoom um, during our annual meeting. Judges and conferences attendees are going to um, be watching a video playlist. So this, the students will not be presenting live. They will be submitting videos, but we will be watching and judging live for our preliminary rounds and our final round of competition. Um, so we will be asking all of the participating universities to share a, a video file and to register as we always do in advance. Um, for our student competitors. Now we know that some institutions are gonna be holding the, their competitions early in the spring semester and may not necessarily know who their winner is when we're asking you to register, but, but just as we've always done in the past, we want to encourage you to register a student as a placeholder and then um, once you have your winner, uh, we'll, we'll get their information and their video and um, PowerPoint slide. So in general, um, we're going to be following the University of Queensland's virtual 3MT guidelines. Um, those are available online and you'll be able to, to click on this link um, with the PowerPoint slide. But they have a whole section, I mean, it's a wealth of information, really valuable tips, um, not only for you as a host of a competition, but also the students as they're preparing for the, the competition. And the virtual guidelines are absolutely intended to maintain the integrity of the competition as it's always been held in the past. And it's still very much about focusing on graduate students' research presentation skills. So even though it's on video, even though they're recording it, they put into place um, guidelines that are very much about keeping those um, things intact with the 3MT. So here's what's the same, what to expect that's the same. Still three minutes. If you go over three minutes, uh, the competitors are disqualified. The time starts when the presenter begins speaking. Um, still a single static slide is permitted. Uh, no slide transitions, no animations, no movement. Um, uh, no electronic media, no props. Everything is supposed to be spoken word, no poems, raps, or songs. 
Um, and the judging rubric is also still the same. And of course, the decision of the judges is final and the same. What's different is that instead of the students partic um, participating in a live way, they're going to be doing a video. And so there are some basics about what that video has to look like, how it has to be filmed. Um, and, and so that is to ensure some the consistency there. So filmed on the horizontal, filmed on a plain background. Um, we've talked a lot about um, virtual backgrounds and, and how we want to make sure that those are not used. One of the conversations that we had yesterday as, as we met as a group with Desi and Lori and, <coughs> excuse me, and Kim and Philip was that um, we also don't want to see the, the slide, the PowerPoint slide used as a virtual background behind a student presenting. So plain background, filmed from a static position, one camera angle, um, we have some really um, uh, talented graduate students who may be able to do lots more than one camera angle, but this is not about the video. It's about the presentation. Um, and then the kicker is it has to be no editing. So no, it has to be a continuous three minute audio with no sound editing, no breaks. Um, and then, of course, it should include a static power, uh, PowerPoint slide that is visible either continuously or cut to. Um, and what 3MT says or what Queensland says is that if it's cut to um, where you don't see the presenter any longer, that the maximum time that the slide can be up is one minute. So that's what the University of Queensland say, says is different. Mary, can you move up the uh, slide a little bit? I can't see the bottom line. I, I cannot. Oh, you can just read out the last part then. Um, the, last, the last line says includes a static PowerPoint slide. Yeah, that one. Is visible continuously or cut to for a maximum of one minute. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. And Mary, after this, with the recording, we can make sure this deck is available for everybody yes, as well. absolutely. Right? Okay, yes. very good. So um, here's how we're going to be a little bit different than the, the Queensland virtual rules. We are going to ask that, I mean, these are kind of details, but um, we're gonna ask that the competitor videos not include a title slide because we're gonna make those uniform and we will include those in our slide deck um, or playlist of videos. We are also likely going to be asked that the competitor be visible throughout the video rather than um, showing only the slide at any given point. Now that means that the slide can still take over the, the frame. We're just going to ask that the presenter still be video or in the corner or so forth um, uh, on the actual recording itself. We are also going to ask for submission of both the PowerPoint slide and the video. Um, so we're not going to just have the PowerPoint slide available in the video itself. We want to be able to, to include that in our slide deck or our playlist. And then we're going to ask that the submissions come from the university rather than the individual student. We are going to have you upload the PowerPoint slide and also the, the video file to a shared drive. So we'll provide all of that information um, rather than using uh, URL links, um, hyperlinks. And the other big difference is because of how we're managing our conference, there is not going to be an opportunity um, after the preliminary rounds for the 
people who make it to the final round of competition to submit a new video. Of course, there's, there's just not going to be time for that. Um, they do offer some recording tips, and we, we have learned that there are some recording tips that need to be kind of at the front of the conversation as you're working with your students. Um, make sure that they know that it's not going to be judged on the video or the recording quality or, or editing capabilities, but we want to make sure that the lighting is good so that you can actually see the face of the presenter. Um, we want to make sure that the audio quality is clear, loud enough, don't have distortion. Uh, one of the conversations that we had yesterday with the group is, I mean, there really is an understanding or, or thought that, that they should consider standing while presenting rather than in a sitting format. Um, but, but that's going to be one of our recommendations as well. And then, of course, we want them to watch their eye movement and not read from a script because, of course, it's being videoed so we could potentially, you know, put up your sheet of paper and talk to the camera. And that's not what we what what 3MT is about. And quite honestly, the eye movement and the presentation will show it. Um, and the University of Queen, Queensland has a whole um, guide for competitors. And it's fantastic. And you should take a look at it and encourage your participants to take a look at it. Um, Beyond that, we wanted to turn this over to a conversation about how campuses are adapting the workshops and the competitions on their own campuses, um, how, how you guys are encouraging student participation, faculty buy-in, and, and definitely address some of the questions that, we, we, that you submitted on the logistical challenges and the technical issues that need to be considered. And so with that, I'm turning it over to Philip. Great, so um, as far as the technical side of it goes, um, whenever we were going into uh, some research for what other universities were trying for their 3MT this semester, really put them in two different, uh, there were those who were doing essentially a synchronous event, like we were talking about doing for the regional competition, and then um, other universities who are doing it asynchronous, where faculty, um, sorry, where students upload their videos in advance, it's made available to the judges, and then the evaluations of the individual presentations kind of happen offline, and then there's an award ceremony. Um, and so there are kind of advantages and disadvantages or added complications to both sides. I'll be focusing on a little bit about what we um, are doing, kind of how that fits together. It's probably going to be very similar to what a lot of y'all have already started at your universities, but um, we should also talk about um, the asynchronous option as well. Um, when we had a meeting earlier this week, uh, UAB showed us their website and how they have it laid out, and it's they're they're also farther along in terms of their deadlines for submission, and um, it's a really great option. There are a lot of advantages going that way as well. So uh, before I dig into what we're doing, I'm talk a little bit about kind of how we got there and our experiences in previous years and how we were really trying to take advantage of the fact that we're doing it differently this time. So I think most of y'all have probably done or tried doing uh, 3MT workshops for students or practice sessions in advance of 3MT to kind of get a little bit more buy-in with participants. And trying it a few years, we found that buy-in for students before the competition itself wasn't great. You know, we could, we could get students in to kind of explain what 3MT was, but there weren't very many who were interested in developing their idea or developing their research into a 3MT format, you know, kind of starting off their slides and doing things like that in a workshop setting really early on. There were a few, but not many. And so last year, we decided to shift to was building a little bit more of incentive during the preliminary round, um, giving a, a smaller cash award for students who qualified for the finals. and using that as a little bit more, to get a little bit more buy-in from them to commit to doing workshops in between the preliminary round and the finals. Um, in addition, we had workshops with the finalists in between um, our awards, uh, our initial award ceremony and the CSGS regional competition. 
And those were um, probably similar to what y'all have tried with um, veteran judges, faculty who have worked with 3MT a lot in the past. We made sure we got a range of different faculty um, from different backgrounds who could give different pointers to the students. And that was all done in person. And so for the preliminaries, we had about seven students, seven or eight students who participated regularly in those workshops. Um, and we saw real market improvement. And especially with the students who ended up winning, uh, they were not necessarily the strongest ones who qualified in the preliminary rounds, but they were the ones who went to all the workshops and really um, benefited from the feedback that they got from faculty. And so uh, after we uh, participated in the CSGS competition, and I mean, our student participant did just incredibly well, um, and especially in terms of the difference between when she was initially starting and what she ended up finishing with. Uh, we reached out to those faculty who helped us out with the judging and talked about how we were going to plan out for this year. And that was, of course, before everything happened with COVID. But what we concluded was that um, we were going to bump it up a little bit, try to have a few more workshops earlier at the gate, um, but still stick with that same model of having faculty and students partner. Um, and when we reached out to, to them again at the beginning of this semester, or a little bit earlier before that, um, we decided that this online format really was an opportunity to build that out a little bit more because one of the biggest complicating factors that was just getting everybody in on the meetings, finding time to work with all the faculty, getting the room reservations, you know, just having all that laid out. So um, this was really a great opportunity to expand that out a lot more and not just in terms of making that more available to students, but also reaching out to students who otherwise would not be as likely to participate. Our initial concern was that we would um, have less students register. We had a lot that came to our workshop for the first round. And when we talked to faculty about it, their response was actually, um, they really think a lot more students are gonna be able to be involved uh, for a couple of reasons. One, uh, there are a lot of students who feel like they just kind of don't have the personality to get up in front of a large group and talk about their research. And so convincing them that something to do is a little bit harder of an ask. Uh, there are also, in terms of the time constraints, uh, we had a few really, heavy hitting programs in years past where because of the scheduling conflicts with other events and things, they weren't able to have as many participants. And so this year, especially because even though the event itself that we're having is synchronous, um, because they can upload the videos, um, it, there's not as much of a potential time crunch. And so in terms of uh, making that sell to faculty and students, um, especially with everything happening with, it, with things being remote, uh, not just now, but sort of moving forward, um, uh, getting the, the opportunity to really build out that experience communicating in an online platform is something we're really trying to leverage in the workshops and getting more students to participate. So as far as the way we have it laid out on our website, um, it's a lot uh, simpler than what we might have done, but it's we the main thing is that we wanted to keep everything on one page. Uh, Mary, do you think it'd be good to do a screen share for this or should I just describe it or? Okay, let's see, one sec. Do a screen share. Great. And I wanna give a shout out while Philip's looking at this. Um, if you haven't looked at UAB's um, yes. 3MT competition, they're doing theirs a little bit differently. They're, they're going asynchronous mm -hmm. um, with theirs, but, but take a look at their website. Um, they've done a lot of work and it, it's, they're, they're ahead of us. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as far as the way um, that we're doing, a lot of it's happening off the website. And one real big advantage of what they have with uh, UAB is that you can register, you can sign up, upload your content and everything is within the site itself, which is great. Um, so what we have here is just a one pager. The form itself is just getting their basic information like we would for a normal 3MT competition. And uh, the only kind of added aspect of this is that we're actually going to use the results from this form to generate the title pages that are going to be part of the online portion. So uh, Mary mentioned this briefly, but in addition to having the PowerPoint slides, one additional thing that they're adding in is having a title slide. And the idea is that's just going to include the title of the presentation, uh, the name of the student, the regionals, their, their university. And so we decided that for just to kind of keep things more uniform. And since it's likely we're gonna be hosting these on our website after the competition, we wanted to go ahead and remove that 
aspect from the student side and generate those so they would be um, consistent from presentation to presentation. In addition, you know, we have the option of them, you know, picking which one they want their uh, presentation to be included in if they want to be there for the competition itself. And they can ask questions that they have any issues with uploading. But as far as the directions go, we have our own guidelines that are basically a, a summarized versions of what we have from the University of Queensland. And then we also link out to, and I think this should, we should still be able to see the tab with the way I did the screen share. Is this one coming through? Yes. Great. So this is just the one pager that they have for their own guidelines that we talked about a little bit. Um, and really just to reiterate uh, what we already talked about, the main thing that they're focusing on in doing this is that as much as possible, they want to retain the initial kind of purpose of what we're doing with 3MT. So we don't want the slide to detract from the presentation. We don't want students to be able to, you know, combine multiple cuts because the whole point is they're really getting experience doing this in one take. Uh, one thing you'll notice here is that when they talk about transitions, they talk about audio transitions uh, being excluded. And that's because um, if they are using the slides, then it's possible that there could, there, they could, after the fact, impose some kind of an image, and that's fine. If, if they want to do it that way, that's still technically allowed. That, the editing that they're excluding is editing on the audio side. And then uh, we also have a, uh, a link to the guide that's on the University of Queensland site, which I think most of y'all probably seen, but we wanted to make sure students had a chance to get to it because it really walks them through the timeline of developing the whole presentation from the start. So whatever their research is, they start on the drafting side and work across. It gives them not just the rules, but um, some guidelines to keep in mind, particularly with doing this remotely. So um, again, they emphasize the importance of, you know, making sure in your presentation that you're incorporating those kind of same standards that we tell them when they're doing it in person, but they want to keep in mind that because they're doing it in a video format, it's going to be a little different. So maintaining eye contact is more important. Uh, making sure they're not stumbling over their words is important because they could always do another take. So it's likely that the finalists are going to have pretty perfect presentations as far as, you know, not getting stuck in speaking. Um, and so this is, this was something we really want to make sure they focused on. And they talk a little bit about some different ways about making the recordings. And for both the University of Queensland and for what we're doing, we're not necessarily requiring them to use any particular recording platform, any particular format. Uh, and the directions that they'll get after they register, we're going to give them a cap for the size of the file. Um, but that's really going to be the main limiter. So I think the majority will be in an MP4 format. But of course, even if they pick the correct format, if the file's too large, it's going to get really difficult. So especially because we're focusing on not necessarily perfect image quality, we just want to make sure that it's legible and there aren't any kind of distracting issues with the resolution uh, for the audio or the video. And so this was something we want to make sure that they, that they go through. And it's something that we talk about in the workshops with the students as well. So the first two events that we have, and we link to these on our, on our registration page, we're basically just introducing students to the idea of 3MT generally, because many of them don't know about it, and then also to kind of how it's changed remotely. And then the workshops that we're doing are going to be modeling what we did last year with faculty. So students will uh, take turns presenting live on Zoom their, their video recording. So they'll play it, get feedback from faculty, and then we'll move to the next student. And the idea is that we want them to all do that together so students benefit from the feedback. Uh, of other students as well. And during that process, we're going to be asking students to be refining their, their video just like they would be refining their presentation they would be giving in a workshop. Um, so as far as the logistical challenges go, the, the biggest thing that we're having to tackle doing it this way uh, in a synchronous format is making sure that we have a dependable way to pull all the videos during the competition itself, both for the preliminary rounds and for the finals. And the conclusion that we came to, the best way to do it would just be to upload the videos onto YouTube. So the reason why we switched to that is because um, in the University of Queensland, they have it set up to where they're asked to give a video link to play. 
And the concern that we have was that if there was some kind of an issue with the link, if the permissions changed, if there was an issue with copying or pasting it, um, we didn't want, we wanted to know that was going to work before the event itself. So we've taken on that part on our side and built in a little bit of a buffer for the deadline. So students have to register by the 1st of November, upload by the 9th, and the competitions, itself, the competitions themselves or the preliminary rounds will happen on the 11th and 12th. So we've built in a few days just to make sure everything's set up on those playlists. And the idea is that those will not be available until the competition itself. Uh, we'll have them private, students will be able to access it, and it will be playing them in the Zoom meeting, um, and then later making those available for people to view after the fact. Hey, Philip. Yeah. Um, one of the questions that came in is, um, are there any questions or concerns about intellectual property rights when putting this out on YouTube? Yes, so um, we do have in the guidelines that we ask students to confirm whenever they register that basically they're allowing us to share their content. Uh, but we did talk earlier um, that there is sort of an added focus on making sure that during with the slides that they're using, there are no copyright issues. So this isn't necessarily a change from years past. Uh, the University of Queensland talks about this. Uh, it's really important that if students are using an image that they didn't make, that they're citing it or they're you know, potentially paying to use it depending on um, what kind of permissions are they have for the image. But especially because this is something that's gonna be online and potentially getting a fair amount of traffic uh, in the workshops, we're, emphasize, we're gonna be emphasizing to students the importance of uh, staying on top of that. One thing I would add, and this is something that's come up in the workshops in the past, is that generally, I mean, it varies of course from uh, presentation to presentation, but uh, if you can have a unique image, something that you've made yourself or taken, uh, it gives you a little bit more control and a little bit something a little bit more memorable. So I think for most students who are concerned about using a copyright image, uh, depending on the circumstances, I would probably encourage them to think about finding ways to use something that they have themselves or getting something they can make themselves. Um, but that was something that we did talk about. So I think that, and that's also gonna apply for the regional competition as well. As we're reviewing them, we're gonna to have to make sure that the slides don't include anything that's copyrighted. I think you're right. Um, uh, we talked mostly about copyright issues um, with particularly Ruth, yes, on Tuesday morning. But Alan raises that it's more um, a question of um, the, their property being misappropriated. Right, the so, students? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So maybe we do need to look at making the, the videos private or unlisted. Have other um, universities uh, considered this? And what are, what are you doing at other universities? And Philip, you wanna go ahead and stop sharing Yep. Screen. One sec. I think if I close it, it'll stop it. Yeah. Great. Anyone? <laughs> when, when we do it on campus, um, one of the things that we do do is we, we live stream or we, we record it. Um, and we're actually also really encouraging students to use that, that great video on their LinkedIn profiles because it demonstrates something really fantastic that you can explain high level research to a generalist audience and whatever job you're applying for down the road, it's, it's a good skill to be able to demonstrate and to show instead of just saying, I can do this. Um, but it looks it like um, Clemson, you're using Google Drive and Google Play. Um, I think that's to store the videos. But has anybody specifically addressed the question of intellectual property? This is Greg Oaks at Winthrop University, and we haven't got there yet, but I would anticipate for YouTube that we keep it private. Okay. Um, we'll probably have uh, the videos placed on our library's commons system once they're completed. 
um, and there they'll be accessible by the public. But we have an embargo policy whereby scholars can say, hey, you know, mm -hmm. I need six weeks or excuse me, six months, and it's renewable. So we have an apparatus um, that we probably use in this situation for, for the, you know, setting up the TMT competition, use YouTube, keep it closed, but then um, have a second vehicle for allowing um, students to present um, more uh, in a public venue with the embargo option. Very good. I would say, Anara, my expectation is not that we would, I mean, it could be that it's just a slam dunk with all of them, but we probably would not include all of the applicants um, to be available. But for the finals especially, that would be something we want to have as an option. Now, that being said, I don't think we would say that a student who asked us, so there's an option to ask any questions or make comments on the registration. I don't think we would make it a requirement that they would allow us to do it. We would just simply remove their video from the list. Philip, would you want to talk a little bit about um, some of the logistical um, or the technical issues of the file naming conventions? The cop we, we talked about copyright, but format. Um, there was a question also about how to manage the people's choice vote, and I'm hoping that maybe Kim, you could remind us how we did that last year, because um, everybody voted on their phones. And I would imagine we'll still be doing something similar to that um, at the annual meeting. Um, do you happen to remember? But we had questions about how to handle people's choice votes. Yeah. So the great thing about people's choice for doing it uh, with a synchronous event is that it gets people to come. And so the, the, the voting for that, especially in Zoom, is pretty straightforward. Uh, now, it's possible there are some universities who are making it more of a social media thing. And so for the finalists, they're sharing them and making it sort of more broadly available to the public outside of the Zoom event. That's another opportunity as well. Logistically, I think um, the, the biggest question is uh, kind of how soon you want to turn around tabulating those votes, um, depending on what kind of a platform you're using and if you want to announce those along with the other winners. So in our case, we'll have the, the judges move to a breakout room and determine the winners separately while people are still waiting. And so that means that we've only got, you know, a few minutes to get all that figured out. And it's usually a bit of a shuffle. So while that's going on, we'll have another group that's handling, making sure we've got all the people's choice covered. Now, another thing that I, I don't think has come up yet, but it's important to kind of again, maintain the integrity of sort of what 3MT is trying to do is that whether it's a synchronous or an asynchronous event, one of the requirements is that the judges only view the video once. Mm -hmm. And so, and that would be the same for people's choice, I'm assuming, unless you do it in more of a social media context where people can watch as much as they like. But um, the idea is that, you know, they're not necessarily, they're not giving a presentation that is geared toward, you know, repeated viewing. They need to really make sure the main points come through once uh, and so the things that might be missed or more subtle you know don't really have, to have as much of an impact so that's a question about how you want to do people's choice which of course isn't really i mean it's sort of in a different category but it's something worth considering uh, on the technical side of things as, as far as files go uh, like i mentioned at least on our end we're not necessarily focused on requiring them to do it in a certain particular video format um, because making those conversions generally is pretty straightforward as long as the file isn't too large um, we do have that buffer built in, so if we have an issue with um, uploading a video, we can always reach out to the student and ask us to give it to us in a different format. But the big thing we wanted to do was really lower that threshold for participation. And depending on the program, depending on the background of the student, it's really likely they're more proficient in one platform or another. So um, that was one decision we made pretty early out the gate, that we weren't going to have a lot of requirements about that. We will, so one question that has come up, will there still be different heats? We will have more um, 
separate heats and those will be set up um, uh, with the program. Karen, would you want to talk at all about the program and how those are going to work? Not to put you on the spot. Well, I, if I can pull my file up real quickly, I can talk about it and see if I've got it. The number of heats is certainly going to be dependent upon how many submissions we have, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So everyone, this is tentative um, and the, we're still working as a, as a uh, planning committee to get this finalized. But what we're thinking about is holding this meeting on uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday morning, the 24th through the 26th. Those are the dates everybody's familiar with. Um, and it, it will start probably with um, a coffee chat where we have um, opportunity for uh, our sponsors to talk to the group. Then we'll move into a plenary that'll go from nine to about 10. We'll have about a 10 minute break. Then we'll move into an hour of breakouts followed by a break. And then from 11 to noon, we have 3MT heats one and two on Wednesday. And then sort of the same format on Thursday with heats three and four from 11 to noon on Thursday. And then on Friday, we will have um, a plenary, a break, 3MT finals from 10.30 to 11.30, followed by about a 15 minute break. And then we'll have an awards ceremony um, and all that kind of wrap up at that point. Um, and I assume that what we'll do at that point is, is um, make our announcements as to the winners of 3MT. So that's sort of the format that we're looking at in terms of um, what those three days will look like. And again, we're, uh, I know that I'm leaving out a whole lot of detail there, but, but basically one hour increments of time where we go through um, starting with a coffee chat, through a plenary, through breakouts, through 3MT, and then end the day with, we actually plan to have uh, noon to 1 p.m. tabletops, lunch, people bring their a brown bag type thing where people have their lunch and we have tabletop topics. So we'll be running, considering this would be Eastern time, um, running 8.30 to about 1. Um, so having the, the 3MT uh, folded into that is the last event before the tabletop breakouts, the tabletop uh, discussions. Mm -hmm. So any questions on that, anybody? Okay. This is great. So another question that came in, um, is are we offering to film participants who are un unable to do it by themselves um, on your campuses? And I mean, on our campus, we have actually set up um, a space where students can go um, to do presentations like this, um, whether it's a conference presentation or a job interview and so forth. And so it, the space is really great for this kind of thing. And yes, we would, we would absolutely work with them if they needed um, assistance in filming. Uh, but, but we have pretty much learned that most of our graduate students' skill sets are higher than ours <laughs> um, on these things. But, but we do have um, the opportunity to do that. We also have a university-wide site license for Zoom. And so most of the students are getting pretty confident and, and comfortable in doing presentations and recording presentations on Zoom. But that's, that's our platforms. Um, are others doing something differently? That's a great question, Alan. Um, has anyone considered going fully synchronous for their school competition and having students give their presentations live? We thought about it. And in fact, we, we were leaning towards doing that. And then we started to read the University of Queensland's uh, materials and got really concerned about the, the technical pieces. And um, uh, what if something goes wrong? What if um, VPN access goes down or this or that? And, and so that really convinced us to do the recordings, um, to still do it 
to still have an event, but that it's done with a playlist so that we can control um, for a judge judge's internet connection going down or, or something like that. Philip, you want to add anything to that? Oh, yeah. One other detail about the video editing is that um, the the guidelines specifically mention that the timing starts when the student starts speaking, just like it would be, you know, if it was happening in front of a live audience. So if a student's using Zoom, if they're using some kind of setup on their phone, uh, you know, making that transition to actually doing the presentation itself isn't something that has to be super clean and professional. I mean, we want it to not be distracting, but especially in the preliminary rounds where we're getting students participating, uh, the main thing is that they just get that, th that three minute block without any kind of cuts recorded. And uh, n another thing is that we found in our own experience that really quality presentations uh, in the past have been clumped together within specific programs, not necessarily the same program every year, but one big reason why we see this is first, when you get a buy-in from a faculty who's willing to work with students a little bit, but also students working with each other and kind of together deciding they're gonna do this. And so one thing we're really trying to encourage this year is getting students to work together. And so it may be that, you know, they take turns in the room that we've set up where they can just have a phone and each record each other. Uh, there are different ways that they can collaborate without it, even though it's not um, happening in person. In fact, because it's a recording, there's more opportunities for that in some ways. So another question is, how are you controlling for not using notes or script? <laughs> We've, we had this conversation with our group um, Tuesday morning too. Um, I don't know that there's an ability to, yeah. to control for that other than um, I think you'd be able to tell in the, the presentation, but Philip? Yeah, I don't think it's so much that this is, um, that we would say, you know, if there was real signs of someone reading notes, they would be breaking a rule and therefore be disqualified or lose points. It's more just, you're unlikely to give the kind of presentation that's going to be compelling, or it's gonna be competitive, right? To, with people who have actually worked on it and given it fresh. I mean, it's one thing to make sure it's not obvious that you're reading off of notes on the bottom of your screen or something like that. And it's another to speak in a way that um, is engaging. And that's, you can't really, com if they're competing with other people that have actually worked through their presentation, don't just have memorized script. Because in some ways it's, it's comparable to, you know, generally what they say for 3MT presentations for people who are doing it in person is, you wanna make sure you have it worked out, but you don't wanna memorize every word because it's not gonna be, it's not gonna work as well. So it's kind of for the same reason. That, that's the argument we're gonna make for students at our university is that you don't wanna read mainly because it's not gonna be the kind of presentation that's gonna come off as well as something that it, you can do, you know, more, uh, not impromptu, but not scripted. Okay, another question came in um, in terms of the eligibility requirements for students to participate. Um, are both doctoral and master's students eligible? At CSGS and on our campus, we have always um, made the, the competition open to both master's and doctoral students. And in fact, last year, our winner was a master's student. Yep. And um, she, worked her, she worked hard to beat um those doctoral students but um that's correct right jack that and karen it's open kim open to to yes absolutely and i would also say um we've also had winners at csgs who had not finished the dissertation yet you know who had not finished the final research project yet too mm -hmm. so um mm -hmm. i think that's that's important to note now again part of the criteria is the significance of the research and the, and the, and the content, but it doesn't mean that it, the, all, all loops have been closed on that. Mm -hmm. You know, what's interesting is um, this is really a, a good challenge for these students because I'm thinking back to the more uh, impressive presentations and so many times folks have made decisions about like when to walk a few steps to the right, when to look at this, right? This is, this is a big challenge, you know, it is simply going to be voice and pitch and making decisions about how to emphasize. You can see that the Italian will have a hard time not using his hands. Um, Kim, thank you for, for demonstrating. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting uh, and, a, and, a, and a fine professional development opportunity 
yet again, albeit different. So uh, this is really exciting to see this come together. And in, in terms of, oh, sorry. I was going to say, um, Sanjay just asked, does CSGS accept non-science submissions from the humanities and so forth? Oh, yes. oh absolutely. Oh, yeah. We, didn't yes. English, yes. English, either, English either won it or came in second a year or two ago yeah. at CSGS. So um, on, the, on, a, on a gothic novel, if I recall. Yeah, so students sometimes feel self-conscious about this, depending on where they're coming from whether they're masters or doctoral, STEM or non-STEM, already finished, or maybe they're only a year and a half or so in. And what we, what we tell them is, is there's kind of a trade-off either way. Part of the challenge is you've got, you only have three minutes. So the more advanced your project is, the more technical it is, maybe you can translate that into making it more compelling, but it also means you have a lot more to fit. And yep. so if you're doing a thesis level project, that gives you a lot more room to really you know, dive in in a way that um, someone who maybe has to pick a chapter of their dissertation to focus on can't. And so it, it, it's a balance on either side. It, it's just different advantages and disadvantages. Okay, Philip, another question. We noticed that the University of Queensland was using Vimeo for students to upload their videos. Did we evaluate that um, as well during our planning process? So, I have, I frankly don't have as much experience with using Vimeo. I know it's an option that students could use, um, but at least with what we've been rolling out on our side with more online content since COVID at our university, we've been using Panopto linked with Zoom and YouTube. So that's what we focused more on just because it was more, we were more familiar with. Does anybody else have experience with Vimeo that might be able to speak to that? I know like as an experience as a user, um, I've never, so I should say, when I've used Vimeo to watch videos, they're generally, the layout's nice and clean and better quality in a lot of ways. It's less cluttered than YouTube, but I've never been on the back end of it. Ah, very good question. Yeah. Prepping the video, the judges for virtual. Um, I think this is a big, big issue if you're going to go asynchronous because you're going to really have to to challenge the judges to only watch it once um, or control for for it um, but i think that that's going to be an important piece is preparing the judges for the the virtual but one of the benefits of a virtual with your judges is you're asking for a lot less time from them. You're making it easier for them to participate. There's no travel involved. And it's actually, we think it's going to be a great opportunity to get um, some of our alumni who are not located here in Louisiana uh, to participate. And we also have, um, well, to be honest, some donors um, and some legislators uh, who will be inviting we're not going to invite them to participate in the prelims, um, but we are going to invite them to participate in the finals uh, because by then we've got those students really solidly prepared and it's a great way to show the research that's happening on our campus. Uh, but I do think that there will have to be some conversations about how it works virtually and so forth. Yeah. So one thing I didn't mention is in the workshops that we're doing, uh, they're open to both faculty and students. I think we had at least one faculty last time for the one that we did a couple weeks ago. Uh, so that's, that's one thing is that we're trying to make sure that they're kind of preparing for that. We also gave them a brief walkthrough about what to expect whenever we had um, a grad faculty meeting a few weeks back as well. And so, and, and again, their response was really positive. So I think that the main thing is that for the judges themselves, um, giving them that extra time to really understand how it works. And in some ways it's going to be easier because they may have less preconceived ideas about what a 3MT should be, depending on who the judge is. Yeah. Yeah, definitely having the ability for the judges to confer together is going to be an instrumental part and that will be a logistical 
um, thing to work out in advance, whether it's a, a Zoom breakout room or, or another Zoom call or something, I think will be important to do. Yeah. Well, it is 1256, the hurricane is coming. Um, our university is now officially closed, but I wanna say thank you for giving us the opportunity to, to present and it, it helped us really get to work on our own processes in campus and uh, nothing like putting it on the calendar to, to get it done, but I really wanna say thank you, Jack. Mary, yeah, thank you. this is nice. great. Mary, Philip, this was extraordinary. This is wonderfully helpful. Everyone is in agreement. I wish you could hear all the applause. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, it, it was really great. And I could see this becoming an, uh, uh, an annual forum where we would discuss this as, as new things happen and, and we try to engage more students on our campuses uh, participating in such an important event. Um, thank you very much for sharing. Yes, your expertise, Mary and <laughs> Philip. Uh, thank you. Uh, please be safe, the two of you and everybody impacted by this hurricane. Um, as we close, uh, I would like to just reiterate, uh, CSGS will have the next monthly forum on Wednesday, November 13th. That feels right. More information will be sent out on that shortly. You can always visit the csgs.org website for more information on those events. Again, um, our mission is to serve our membership. Uh, CSGS wants to serve graduate education in the Southeast and all the member institutions that participate. We encourage all universities to participate and all folks involved in graduate education at those universities to participate. If you have suggestions or ideas for future panel discussions that we need to address, perhaps in these forum discussions or at a conference, shoot me an email directly or uh, DeRockyJ at winthrop.edu. You can also use our conference, uh, conference email, which is csgsconference at gmail.com. With that, we will close and be mindful of everyone's time. Thank you so much for taking time today to learn about the 3MT. Be safe, stay healthy, and uh, look forward to seeing you down the road. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.